For years, they have made our way of life possible. Now, they go unnoticed and uncared for by those who need them the most. Come with us now and explore the plight and the history of the North American shopping cart on this episode of Our Urban Wilderness. Welcome to the show. Long before the blessings of blacktop and supermarkets, large herds of shopping carts roamed the vast North American continent. Today, the life of a shopping cart is one of uncertainty and neglect. In the Badlands of South Dakota, a lone paleontologist, Professor Theo Radcliffe, has been hard at work for the past three years uncovering clues to the ancient origins of modern-day shopping carts. With only his thoughts for company, he spends his days toiling away in an unforgiving environment, meticulously scraping and brushing away bits of earth and rock, slowly exposing pieces of a prehistoric puzzle. The first thing one will notice right off the bat when comparing shopping carts of 20,000 years ago with their modern day counterparts is their size! Which makes sense when you consider that the world of the last ice age was a very dangerous place. Shopping carts had to be bigger, not only for protection but also to carry the, the, the larger produce and, and canned goods of the time. You know, a lot of my peers said, you're crazy Theo to get dropped off all alone in the middle of nowhere, miles from the nearest mall, factory outlet, or convenience store to do research on shopping carts. <laughs> and then they would laugh. Oh yeah, they would laugh. <laughs> Did you know, for example, that, that, that electrical outlets do not naturally occur in nature? I did not know that. Hello? It's pretty Hello? hardcore out here. I, I can't even get a cell phone signal out here. Ah! Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? No. Oh, who am I kidding, huh? Who would I call, huh? Who? <laughs> I'm Theo Radcliffe! <laughs> and my research is my life! <laughs> Hooray for me, huh? <laughs> With me! <sighs> God, I need a shower. Bidding a reluctant goodbye to the professor and his solitary research, let's move forward in our story's timeline several thousand years. Here we find Native American consumers still enjoying the bountiful resource that shopping carts provided. It is small wonder, then, why the shopping cart figures so prominently in their folklore and religion. The shopping cart is sacred to our people. It is much part of uh, who we are as a carpet we walk on. The bottled water we drink and the filtered air we breathe. The shopping cart came to us a long time ago. Before time of the parking lot, it was a gift from the spirit of the great cashier who appeared to a young maiden. She was crying because she was hungry, tired, and cold after many hours of trying to find food on a windswept prairie. 
When the maiden saw the cart, it was filled with food items. Far more than 15 allowed in the express lane. The land was soon filled with shopping cart as the spirit of the great cashier had promised. It was a good thing our people used not only the food in the cart, but every piece of the shopping cart itself. Nothing went to waste. Even the plastic thing that you flip down, when you sit your child in the cart, you know what I'm talking about. The child sits on it while you shop. What the hell do they call that thing? From the journals of the famed Lewis and Clark expedition, we have the first known written account of the North American shopping cart. September 13th, 1804. Our expedition continues working its way west through this treeless region of gentle rolling hills. These spacious underutilized lands are truly blessed with the ample parking needed for future commercial development. Today, since the weather was so pleasant, I suggested to Captain Clark that we have our morning espresso at the top of a small hill near our camp. Upon reaching the hill's crest, we were both taken aback by the sight that greeted us. There, stretching out before us, to what seemed like the horizon, was a great herd of strange beasts. Larger than the wheelbarrows and pushcarts so prevalent in the east, these creatures were metal and moved about by means of four small squeaky black wheels their heaping baskets laden with all manner of canned goods, produce, and bless the almighty alcoholic libation. We stared dumbstruck for several moments until Captain Clark had the presence of mind to bring down one of the beasts with but a single shot from his musket. We then sat down on the spot for an impromptu feast. Afterwards, feeling quite seated and relaxed, we lay there in the tall grass and talked for hours about the lucrative merchandising possibilities of this new find, fashions back east, and what a know-it-all bitch Sakakawea is. Meriwether Lewis, Corps of Discovery. In a short amount of time, the West began to fill with a host of bargain-hungry consumers, eager to tame the unpaved wilderness. No longer calorically restricted, the pioneers instantly began expanding their waistlines as well as the limits of their civilization. Convenience marts and strip malls began to proliferate across the landscape. More and more of the great herds were cleared off the land, so that by the latter portion of the 20th century, only a handful of shopping carts remained in the wild. The year was 1971. Overseas, the United States was bogged down in a poorly thought out market expansion in Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, cola taste tests divided consumers on the home front. The embattled president, Richard Nixon, in an attempt to improve his sagging approval ratings, signed an executive order that would directly impact the wild North American shopping cart. Only two other individuals, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and Honorary U.S. Drug Marshal Elvis Presley were present at the late night signing. Thanks to the release of declassified audio tapes, we can now listen in as history was being made. <clears throat> I want to make one thing perfectly clear. Elvis, those pills you brought <laughs> are dynamite. Oh. Uh -huh. Yay, hey, I'm all shook up. Oh, I'm shaking like a, I'm shaking like a leaf here. But... Okay, Richard, focus. I was about to do something important. Mr. President, I believe you are going to sign the executive order on your desk that will help preserve... Shut up, Henry. I'm thinking. And for the love of J. Edgar Hoover, where the hell are your pants? 
Mr. President, I felt that they were binding and possibly blocking the flow of my chi. Blocking the flow of your chi? What in blue blazes are you babbling about, Henry? You need some serious help, my friend. But first things first, let's side this damn thing. How can I be expected to sign my John Hancock when this godforsaken pen won't write? Henry! Isn't this the worthless piece of crap pen you gave me last Christmas? I am as confused as you are, Mr. President. It is a very expensive pen, I assure you. But if I may, I would like to digress for a moment and tell you about the colors I am seeing. Shut right up, now. Henry. Just shut up. God, I wish you'd shut up. Uh, hold on there, Mr. President. I just happen to have a commemorative Graceland pen in the lapel of my jumpsuit. Here you go. Why? Why, thank you, Elvis. You're indeed a man of action. I want that back, though. What do you know? My signature looks like a million bucks. That's a damn fine pen, Elvis. Damn fine pen. All righty, then. That's all done. What should we do now? Uh, I could go for some chicken and waffles. Capital idea, Elvis. Capital idea. Henry! Yes, Mr. President? Get out there and find us some chicken and waffles. I could go for some chicken and waffles. You hear that, Henry? Elvis must feed. Now get going! Your boy, Mr. President. Oh, shut up, Henry! Chicken and waffles. I love the chicken and waffles. I'd hump them if they were here right now. I want some chicken and waffles. I have my own butter I put on them. Oh, chicken and waffles. Chicken and waffles. I could go for some chicken and waffles. And so it was. With one stroke of a cheap novelty pen, Richard Nixon brought the great American shopping cart back from the edge of destruction. And on the scene came a new breed of activists, fueled by patriotism and completely unmarketable job skills. we're doing is we're responding to reports of a shopping cart seen hanging out in uh, the parking lot of a, an old abandoned impulse by food mart. In most cases we find that it's a cart that's been abducted from a local supermarket either by a vagrant needing a beast of burden or uh, an elderly shopper looking for companionship manages to escape and then seeking the familiarity of uh, captivity it uh, just looks for refuge in a, some random supermarket parking lot. That's when we're called in. Hold on. I think our repeat customer has returned. Look at that. Oh, it's beautiful. guessing it's a male, judging by the size, but it's always a little bit hard to tell. Either way, it is absolutely gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Stan, hand me the rifle. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, tranquilize the shopping cart, sedate it. This is a precautionary measure, just uh, it's as much for our safety as it is for theirs. We find that uh, when they've been allowed to run feral for a while, then capture can pose a bit of a challenge. Last season, Stan got his fingers caught in uh, the fold-out seat portion of a card. He'll tell you it's smart. On the move. Come on. Go. Go, go, go. Out <laughs> <Not> cold. <laughs> Oh. <sighs> 
Doctor. Oh. Adult male here. Uh, it's got uh, such a few little scrapes and bruises all along here. It's probably from the cars running into it. No. Looks like we got a little wheel rot. Nothing that we can't take care of really easily. But, uh, other than that, it's in pretty good shape. Sleeping Beauty doesn't know it here, but he's one lucky baby. After a short recuperation, the shopping cart is healthy enough for the three-day journey that eventually ends in the wilds of northern Montana at a government preserve consisting of thousands of acres of land set aside specifically for shopping carts. The time has come for Stacy and Stan's shopping cart to begin its new life with others of its kind. It is an emotionally charged moment for the two activists. I always promise myself I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get emotional, but you know it's hard. It's, uh, you know, you, you give so much into this this beautiful creature, and so much love and so much time, and to to see it, <sighs> sorry, to see it um, returning to its natural habitat. It's just, it's such a moving experience. It's like, like watching your child that you if you've loved and raised and given so much to just wander off on his own into the woods. <laughs> that didn't come out right at all, did it? As Stacy and Stan begin their journey back towards civilization, the recently released shopping cart adjusts itself to its strange new surroundings. Soon, finding a home with others of its kind, the shopping cart spends the summer feeding on the tall grasses of a secluded mountain valley. The heat of the summer sun soon gives way to fall's cool breezes. The leaves and the trees explode in a frenzy display of color before falling to the ground like crumpled receipts. With winter coming and their baskets now full from weeks of grazing, the male shopping carts begin squaring off in the timeless ritual meant to decide dominance and access to the breeding females. The sound of these clashes reverberates throughout the valley for days, but finally, a victor emerges. It is the herd's most recent addition, the former stray, who wastes no time in making the most of his newly won alpha status. Winter's icy hammer falls early this season, but thousands of years of evolution have made the shopping cart ideally suited to handle the impact of weather's harsh extremes. Though some do fail to meet nature's challenge, come spring's return, the vast majority of the herd is there to greet it. 
the shopping carts, begin to fulfill their own obligation to the cycle of life. Another generation of shopping carts joins the herd, thanks in part to the hard work and diligence of activists like Stacy and Stan. We have hope. I'm Emmett Domain. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for the secret life of the folding chair on our urban wilderness. Woo-woo-woo-woo-woo! <laughs>